Morning, everyone. So four weeks ago, I stood up here and made a smart joke about having COVID. And on Monday, I did. As well as the person on the sound and the person on the, the slides as well. So um, maybe the first time ever there was direct prophecy in Glen Abbey. Um, anyhow, what do the following things have in common? Barcodes, credit cards, armored helicopters, Henry Kissinger, former US Secretary of State, the European Union when Greece joined to give 10 countries and the Pope. Close. If you grew up in the church circles um, that I did in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s, you would know the answer to this question because it's actually really obvious what they all have in common. They were all mentioned in Revelation, of course. We had these things called prophetic witness meetings. I, I kind of called them pathetic witness meetings. But they were popular and they were showcases for all kinds of theories about the end of the world and revelation in, in particular. And of course, intrigue is seductive. And oh my goodness, the stuff that went around. And remember these were like well before internet days, um, before information could spread like wildfire, all these wild theories went around. And of course, the one telling thing for me when I look back is that pretty much everything that was predicted back then proved not to be true. I'm hoping that most of us have been, have been sticking with the last week of our immersed series reading through uh, the New Testament. And this week, if you have, you've been making your way through the second half of Revelation. And I bet it hasn't been easy. Without doubt, it's a strange book. But there's a key question that we need to ask ourselves with every part of Scripture. And if those speakers 40 years ago had started here, they may not have made such embarrassing mistakes. And here it is. What did this mean to the people who heard it first? If we start there and we come up with an answer that would have made no sense to them, then we really need to pause. Now, of course, there are secondary applications, especially when we're dealing with prophecy, but the starting point should always be the same. The primary significance needs to be seen in what it meant to the people at the time. And with that as a guide, then we can be confident that none of those things I mentioned at the start are the main lessons of Revelation because credit cards, barcodes, and armored helicopters would have meant very little to anybody living in the first century. Today, we're supposed to cover the second half of Revelation. Well, we can't do justice to that at all. But what I hope we can do is to look at it in a way that may help us apply some of the lessons of Revelation to us today, because we're going to try and understand it through the eyes and ears of its first hearers or readers. Some of you will likely have experienced Christians falling out with each other over their interpretations of Revelation. Well, we don't want to go there today. Hope you're not disappointed. I could certainly give you my considered opinion, and I'm not even sure it's considered, on some of the ideas um, with no confidence in their rightness, um, but I'm not sure how helpful that would be anyway. What I'd rather do is see if we can find some key messages that will be true, no matter how we answer all the wider, more complex questions, and then see how it impacts us today. And I'm just going to pick on one topic that hopefully will help us. And this is what I'm calling it. Church, the wow factor. Now, maybe if you were asked to pick one word to describe church, wow wouldn't be the one that you'd pick. Because let's be, let's be honest, we haven't always made a great job of being church. And yet in God's eyes, the church of Jesus Christ really is something that is a wow. Before we get into it, just have a look at this picture from Revelation 21. And let, let's, read, let's read some of this. One of the seven angels who had 
the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Next one, David, I'm following you here. <laughs> it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three in the south, and three in the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. That's how the end of Revelation paints a picture of the church, the bride of Christ. And when we sometimes get frustrated with church and with each other, it does no harm to raise our eyes to that and to want to live up to that calling that God has placed on it and on us at that great privilege. But that's not the wow I want us to think about today. I want to go a slightly different direction. I want to use the three letters of wow to give us something simple to think about when it comes to how we see ourselves as God's people, both in terms of the first century Christians and also our role today. And I'm going to root this in some verses from chapters 10 and 11, because I think in there we're told something of what the church is meant to be. And the first one is this, to be church means to be witness. We see several aspects of this in, in chapters 10 and 11. It starts with John himself, the writer, and then it continues into chapter 11 with two witnesses. And from them, we learn something of what witness means. We'll read some of this as we go through this morning. If you remember back to Jesus' closing words to his disciples, um, recorded in Acts 1, he said they were to be his witnesses. And that commission was passed through the apostles to all of God's people, called to be witnesses in every part of the earth. And in this part of Revelation, that commission is reiterated. Firstly, the call comes to John in chapter 10, verses 9 to 11. So let's read that. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and things. So that was John's calling to share God's message. And then that calling was passed down to the whole church, down through time, called to be witnesses to the Lord. If you actually read those chapters 10 and 11, they're, they're really quite difficult. Some points of interpretation are very difficult. And there are no shortage, there's, there is no shortage of commentators um, who have tried to figure out who the two witnesses are and, and have taken them literally, predicting that the world is waiting for two great Christian figures to emerge in Jerusalem and have great impact there. There have been many suggestions as to who those two people might be. Even at one point, someone suggested it was two tailors in London in the 19th century. Now, for me, as, as often, the problem with doing that is the symbolism of, of revelation. To try, every time we try and pinpoint exactly what we think it might be, we may be in danger of losing the fact that there's so much here that's symbolic. And maybe, maybe this is a good time to take a step back and think about the wider message and context of revelation. We need to try and get some grasp of what was going on when John wrote it. So let me try and paint a picture for you. What do we know for sure? Well, we know that it was written by this man called John who was on an island called 
Patmos, had been exiled there for his faith. At this time, the Roman Empire was reacting very harshly against Christians. And as Chris pointed out when he took us through Hebrews, the temptation to give in to the pressure and walk away from the faith was very strong. John, as an old pastor concerned for this young church, needed to get a message of hope to them. So he was given, he was given this great vision from God himself. And he put it into a letter, and this letter had to go to the churches. And if you want a rough summary of the whole letter, here it is. I know this is tough. I know this emperor is evil, but take courage, because he's got it coming to him. And our God will bring him down. Indeed, all who stand against God will fall, and we will win the day. Now, that's a, like, that is the shortest summary ever, of, summary ever of the book of Revelation, and it doesn't do it justice, but it's, it's kind of what John was trying to get across. So think, John wants to get this message off his island to the churches. How does he do it? Have you ever asked yourself that question? How did John send this letter to the churches? Now, you're going to have to hear me out today. I have no authority for what I'm about to say. But, but I want us to try and think this through practically. How does John get this letter from an island to the church? Well, there's likely a postal system run by the prison guards. Well, if they're taking letters off an island, and, and these are prisoners, political prisoners or whatever, what's the first thing they're going to do with any letter that goes off the island? They're going to read it. And if they read John's letter and it says what I just said, it's summarized, what are the chances that letter gets off the island? Pretty much zero. Indeed, even if this letter wasn't sent from an island, but it was taken around the churches, what would happen if a message as simple as that was intercepted? Now, anyway, go back to the island. So the prison guards get John's letter, as we have it in Revelation, and they read it. Well, what do you think they think? They're probably thinking, this poor guy's lost it. You know? Maybe, maybe being stuck in this island for so long has just done his head in because it's going to be absolutely meaningless. It's just look, it'll just look weird. However, imagine that you're a part of this new church and you have been brought up on the Old Testament scriptures. Now, what do you think as you read this letter? Your response is going to be totally different because you'll start to recognize pictures and images and you'll go, oh, that's Isaiah. Oh, that's from Ezekiel. Oh, that's from Zechariah. Oh, that's from Jeremiah. And you start to put all these pieces together and you can start to see the message taking shape. This is a really important point. We can't grasp the truth of Revelation unless we see the Old Testament pictures that are in there. It's a very particular style of writing called apocalyptic and it's highly symbolic. And our challenge is that the more we try to literalize it down to every detail, likely the bigger the trouble we'll make for ourselves. But we'll not go down that rabbit hole this morning. Let, let's stick to just the practical application. We're introduced here to two witnesses and whatever else is meant, it reminds us that the church of Jesus Christ is called to be faithful to him, to stand up for him in a wicked world, and that is true in all generations. And that's why Revelation is such a timeless book, and, and that's why it's often a mistake just to apply it to one time in history, whatever, whatever particular time you want to choose. Here we have principles that are bang up to date for every age, from the early church and her struggle with Rome to our own struggles today living in a in a very radical secular 
society. Our call is to witness to Christ, to be countercultural, to stand against the world's warped values, challenging the darkness and bringing the light of Christ. Too often we lose our way, too easily we lose our way. And the church sometimes can become part of the system instead of standing against it. Now, of course, church should have a voice to society. But it must always be done from the perspective of being above everything else. A witness to Jesus Christ. Allegiance to him comes above every other allegiance. Oh, and by the way, that includes in Northern Ireland as well. The church has made great mistakes when that allegiance has been compromised. The official church in Hitler's Germany. Or even look at what's happening today as the leadership of the Orthodox Church in Russia have walked step in step with an evil tyrant. We have a seriously high calling to be witnesses to Christ and it's not easy. Here's just one reason why it's a challenge. Go back to those words of the angel to John in in chapter 10, 9 to 11. We have this interesting image of John eating the scroll or devouring a book. And it's reminiscent, as I said earlier, of the Old Testament. If you look at Jeremiah 15, 16 and Ezekiel 3, 1 to 3, we, we get the same idea of eating the words of God. When your words came, I ate them. And and in Ezekiel, and he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. You you can see how when, when this letter came that those believers could think back to words like that. Well, when John eats it, it's a bittersweet experience. You see, to be witness to the Lord has two sides to it. The gospel is a message that to God's people really tastes good. But when we're faithful to it, it can hurt. Because it challenges our everyday living. And it puts us on the spot. Further, it's not just a message of salvation. It's also one of judgment. And I was struck reading through Revelation just how often the fact of judgment is mentioned. And that brings the pain of trying to witness to those who refuse to turn. And it can be our own family and friends, and that ought to hurt us deeply. That was the pain that characterized those Old Testament prophets, their own people heading for God's judgment, and that same pain should be ours. There's great honor in being chosen by God to be his witnesses, but it's a bittersweet experience as we realize the gravity of the message. So W means witness. Then there's O. To be church means to be oppressed. I wonder, have any of you seen or read the film stroke book, The Client, by John Grisham? Film was years ago, Tommy Lee Jones, I think was, was it? Yes, he was. Well, if you haven't seen it, you've seen some like it. A crime is committed and there's only one witness who's taken into protective custody and kept safe until they can give their testimony in court. Well, during that time before the court case, the gangsters try everything to intimidate the witness and stop them testifying. You you know the scene, you've seen it many times. Well, in a sense, that's what happens to church or to the Christian who tries to be a faithful witness. The world, inspired by Satan himself, will do all in its power to stop the witness. And that's where oppression comes in. Now, obviously, there was a special relevance to this in in John's day, but it's always relevant for the Christian or church who will take a stand against the values of the day. Stand up for God's truth and there will be consequences. Now, there's an important distinction we need to draw here and to understand what we mean by oppression or suffering. When we talk about Christian suffering and persecution, we're not talking about the kind of suffering that's common to all people. 
disease, pain, trouble that comes. Furthermore, we're not talking about the trouble that sometimes comes to Christians when they're harsh, rude, bigoted, narrow-minded, intolerant, and unloving. Okay? When we suffer because of those things, we deserve everything we get. But we're talking here about the opposition that comes when we refuse to bow down to the world's idols, whatever they happen to be. It may not even involve being vocal or preaching against something. But just when our behavior, when our standards, when our values prick the conscience of the world, then we can expect to suffer. The story here of witnesses in Revelation 11 leaves us in no doubt. The world does not want to be disturbed or confronted. I think back to the story of Herod and John the Baptist in the Gospels. And John the Baptist who dared to confront Herod for his sin and ended up paying a very high price for it. Chapter 11 shows us something of the effect a true witness will have in the word. David, if you stick it up, it's verse six here in chapter 11. And it tells about these witnesses. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Reminders here, again, of the Old Testament. Pictures of Elijah and Moses taking their stand, show us that when God's people are strong for him, they really can have a powerful effect on what's going on around them. And we're being reminded here that that same power of God is at our disposal when we choose to be his witnesses. But when the world hears the warnings of judgment, as in the Old Testament, it usually wants to silence the voice. The witnesses must not be allowed to testify. Let's read on um, from verse seven onwards. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, Some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. It gives a horrible account of what it's like as the world thinks it can put down the church often repeated in history, how evil empires have sought to silence God's people and have gloated when they think they've won. The message is really clear. John really didn't need to remind his readers because they were facing oppression. They were right in it. But we do need to hear, call the world to attention and we will pay for it. In fact, call even religious people to attention and you'll pay for it. I, I just wonder, is it, is it worthwhile us asking how much we really suffer at the hands of the world? I mean, it's not that we want to go out and look for trouble. We shouldn't be doing that. But, but if the answer is that actually we don't, we don't suffer very much, then maybe is it, is it because we're really not all that different? Do our lives not show up the kind of difference that Jesus expects? The Bible consistently shows that to be a faithful witness to the Lord will automatically lead to some kind of oppression. If that never comes to us, maybe we need to question how faithful we are being as his witnesses. Witness, oppression, and the final piece of the puzzle, the church as winners most of all because the the message that the early church needed to hear most of all because the story doesn't end with that horrible picture of the unburied corpses of the witnesses lying in the street with the wicked world gloating no way does it end there it ends with victory and vindication for the faithful witnesses. Let's read on the next couple of verses after that. But after the three and a half days, 
the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Glory for the faithful witnesses. Victory always promised to God's faithful ones, even if you go back to the letters to the churches. Victory was promised to them even as they witnessed, but there was a condition. Verse four of chapter 11 talks of olive trees and lampstands, pictures that go right back to the Old Testament and Zechariah, and especially that word from God, that victory would not be by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. The olive tree with oil and the lampstand are pictures used in scripture for the spirit of God. And that's the key to being victorious in our witness. It's not about being clever. It's not merely about human wisdom and using the right kind of methods. And it's not about great abilities and great planning, even though all of those things are actually important. But the bottom line is about our reliance on the Spirit of God. And as verses five and six prove, and we read those, when we're filled by the Spirit of God, the sky is the limit. Those references to Moses and Elijah showing God's people that when we rely on his power, amazing things are possible. Indeed, in his power, we will accomplish everything he decrees. He will build his church. That's what Jesus promised. Verse seven tells us that the beast, the enemy of God, will only be able to get anywhere after the witness is finished. You see, the task that God gives the church in every age will be completed. It is all under God's control. And even when evil seems to have won the day, as it did seem in places, and it will seem in days to come, it will only be for such a short passing time, three and a half days it's described as here, just showing how short will be Satan's seeming victory. For me, it's like, it's just got echoes of the cross, actually. Jesus seemingly defeated, and hell starts to party, but the party is very short-lived as the resurrection turns hell on its head. And it's interesting that it's, the same picture here um, used to show the victory of God's faithful witnesses as they stand up again, raised to life before the very eyes of their enemies and taken up to glory, winners, whilst the evil world awaits final great judgment from God from which there will be no escape. In chapter seven, we see it in, in the seal that is put on God's people. Here in, in chapter 11, verse one, it's described another way I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. And it, it's an image of, of being counted in, protected, safely secured around the altar. God letting his people know that whatever the wicked world will throw at them, their future is secured with him. Individually, they may suffer. Collectively, it may appear at times as if the church has been defeated. But don't be fooled by all you see. Because God knows who are his. And he will bring them safely home. And in the, ver the words of verse 12, we will hear a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And the enemies of the church will look on. And that's why we need to look at church and go, wow. Because that really will be someday. And we're called to live today in the light of then and to be faithful witnesses to the end. And we may well be oppressed for it, maybe even today at home 
or in work tomorrow. But we gotta remember, we are winners. When the final whistle blows, we will be on the right side. And when that call comes, come up here. It will all have been worth it, despite the tough days along the way. Some of you know I, I have to fly a lot. I don't like flying. I've never liked flying. The early days of flying, actually, I needed medical help to get me through the fear of flying. Why on earth do I do it? Well, because I know that the other side will make it all worthwhile. It's the only thing that gets me on a plane, that what I'm going to do over there, or what I'm going to experience, will make all the trauma worthwhile. And sometimes, we've got to be honest, that it's only the thought of what's on the other side that can get us through some periods in life. The fact that one day, life, with all its turbulence and rough landings, will finally come to an end as we know it. And God will say to us, come up here. On that day, everything will be worth it. Let's pray. Father, we confess that it's really tough for us to read the book of Revelation and, and sometimes make any sense of it. And so Lord, I pray this morning as we've reflected on these things that you would remove what was any rubbish that I have spoken and bring to our hearts what is eternal truth from your word. Would you inspire us, Lord, to be your faithful witnesses? To maybe call to a halt those places where we've compromised and we've not been prepared to take a stand? Would you protect us as we face the, um, the harsh questions, the misunderstandings of the world around us? And Lord, would you inspire us with the vision of home, our eternal home, where you dwell, where you will be with your people in fellowship that can never be broken by our weakness, by our sin, where we will be like Jesus, where we will see him face to face. Father, if our heads are down today, would you lift them up and inspire us to live our todays in the light of that great eternal tomorrow? For his name's sake and for his stand to sing.